So my name is Christopher Mullins. I'm currently a PhD student um, in the Catalysis Research Group, Chemical Engineering UCT. And I'm looking at developing iron catalysts which convert CO2 into hydrocarbon fuels. So we're trying to incorporate hydrogen, renewably generated hydrogen, with CO2 to kind of make a circular hydrocarbon fuel economy. So that's what I'm doing currently. Yeah, so I did my undergraduate at UCT as well, um, chemical engineering. I began in 2015, uh, did it across four years, and then went into my master's here as well. Woo! My master's also UCT catalysis, um, with the same supervisor I'm working with currently. So my PhD project is basically a continuation of what we first started looking at in my master's. Yeah, so it's the same topic, so Masters and PhD is CO2 to fuels with iron catalysts. Um, we found some pitfalls in the catalyst development during my Masters. So the catalysts weren't effective enough and we think we decided on some reasons about why those catalysts weren't working properly. And now in the PhD we've kind of taken those learnings and are now trying to make still iron catalysts, but in a different way that will hopefully work better for the process. Yeah, so it's a good question. So I always like explaining this in terms of the fact that I think the transition to masters, it wasn't bad, it wasn't a jump or anything, but that is mainly because of the, the time you have available to you. Um, in the undergraduate degree, you are extremely busy. You always have assignments, tests, you have full days every day of the year. Um, whereas in masters, it's much more of your own time. Like, the content might be more challenging than what the content in undergrad was, but you have a lot more time to actually engage with it, think about it, um, learn from it, and like create new knowledge, right? So yes, the content itself might be more difficult, but the jump going from undergraduate to the postgraduate, it actually felt like a relief. It felt like I was finally free, if that makes sense. So this is an interesting question and depending on who you ask you might get a different answer but I would say the jump from the masters to the PhD was even smaller than the jump from the, the undergraduate to the masters but I think the main reason for this is the fact that number one I stayed in the same field so I was still doing very similar things so a lot of the learnings I had taken from my masters I'll, I'm already able to use in my PhD right. Um, secondly as well, I don't know if it is such in all departments, but within the catalysis department and with my supervisor, they generally do also like to scope their master's projects at quite a high level. So a lot of the times the master's projects are almost like a mini PhD project where there is, you're not just repeating experiments someone else has already done, you are developing new things, but just with a lot of added guidance. So the jump from masters to PhD, at least within catalysis, is usually not that large. So, so funny enough, that sounds a lot like me, right? I was very good at chemistry. I liked it a lot. And I saw myself having two options. Either I become a chemist or I apply that chemistry knowledge to do something. And that sounded more like engineering to me and therefore I, I chose chemical engineering, right? Um, but if I had to describe chemical engineering and this, I mean, if you look at chemical engineering textbooks, some of these textbooks, their intro chapter will be, what is chemical engineering? Because lots of people don't know and even the people writing these books sometimes find it hard to like put a, a nail on it. Um, chemical engineering, I would say it's almost more of a way of thinking than just one specific discipline. It really teaches you 
how to solve problems, how to think about things in new ways. And yes, there is definitely a heavy mathematical element to it. There is a science element to it, but it's kind of like this problem solving skill is wrapped in those maths and science layers, right? But at the core of it, it's just teaching you to solve problems. And that's why you'll see that once you have this chemical engineering degree, when people are employing you, they're not just employing you in chemical engineering, they're employing you at banks, they're employing you at research institutes. You, you can find yourself anywhere with this degree. So if you're considering doing this, I think, yes, you do need somewhat of a passion for science and maths. But outside of that, it's, it's more about a way of learning to think than anything else. So um, this is quite interesting. And um, before I answer this question, I also want to tell people that while I'm going to outline what my schedule looks like now, my schedule might not have looked like this a year ago, and it might not look like this a year in advance. And I'm not saying from the point of view of how busy I am, but you know, people go through transitions, they go through ups and downs where they're more active, more able to do things, and less able and less able to do things. Where I find myself at the moment, I'm able to do a lot of things, but there have definitely been times at the past where I've struggled and I've not done as much. So I just want to outline that from the start. So also understand where you are emotionally and physical and what you are actually capable of in that time. It's important. But currently my day looks as follows. So I'll wake up in the morning and I generally like to start my mornings quite relaxed because I'm not very much a morning person. Um, so when I get up, I start off with a cup, of a cup of coffee and I'll just read the news, maybe even watch a little bit of YouTube or something if I need some entertainment for about a half an hour in the morning, have my breakfast, get ready for the day. I'll then come up to campus and arrive here around nine o'clock where, depending on whether I'm currently in a teaching mode or a research mode, which depends on the courses I'm tutoring in, I will jump into either doing preparations for my teaching which if we are currently teaching students, I'll be in the class with the students, helping them with their problems, helping them with their projects and advising. If we're not currently in the teaching mode, I will then be setting up schedules for my fellow tutors who I teach with, who should be um, teaching at what times, um, who has what responsibilities, organizing meetings and lots of other administrative duties. So that's kind of my tutoring role. If we're not currently in a tutoring role, I'll then be doing my research project, which is, there are a lot of different things that could be happening in a standard day of research, but a, a lot of the time it involves going into the lab, troubleshooting some problems I've maybe been having with equipment, making new materials and running my reactor. Once I've got data from that, I'll then be sitting at my desk, processing my data, plotting nice graphs, writing nice things, and trying to build a picture of what I'm developing in the lab. Then once I'm done for the day, at the campus at least, there are one of two things I usually do. So I'm a firm believer in exercise and also winding down, keeping your, your work separate from you know, your after work life. Because I think if you don't have that, it's very easy to burn out. So once I leave campus at four, five or six in the afternoon, I, I will go home and do an hour of exercise, so just calisthenic exercise or on specific days, I currently am also doing ballroom dancing. That's just something else I consider as exercise, um, but it also has a nice social aspect to it. So I'm getting my exercise out of the way, I'm talking to people, I'm dancing, I'm learning a new skill. And I find these two things really help me de-stress from work life. And then in addition to that, I will also do some meditations. I try to do a meditation at least every day of the week. It's not always possible, but just sitting down for 10 minutes, kind of not doing anything, not really thinking about anything and just sitting with your thoughts. Um, and that can also really help you manage your emotions. Um, and I find that if you want to be busy, if you want to have fully packed days, that is something you really need to look after. It's just your thoughts and your feelings. You, you need to sit with them a little bit and just give your body time to de-stress. And that's a day in my life. <laughs> so definitely it's not 
as easy for all of us. We all have different journeys and some people's journeys are definitely more challenging than others. I 100% agree with that. But I also think that you just need to keep that knowledge in mind that there are always these people, even from the most humble backgrounds, who make it big and they make it real big. And if they've been able to make it, you will be able to make it as well. And yes, you might have to work harder than the guy next to you, but the fact that you've had to work so hard for something, I think a lot of the time can also make you more hungry for it. Like you'll have more drive than that other guy who had more than you to start off with, right? You have more reason to succeed. So I think you really need to take that, that drive and that hunger and use it to like fuel the activities that you need to make it. So you, you need to work hard, you need to be consistent, and you need to look after yourself. I think those are the three things I can tell you. But really use that, you know, I can do this and I don't have a lot, but I really want that, that drive. You need some kind of passion that pushes you forward. So I think that's a really weird thing because maybe on the outside I look confident, but even now I sit with lots of doubts every day. Like, and lots of times I'm questioning, am I doing the right thing? Am I actually this guy? Am I this person who I'm portraying to the world? I, I think that is even the most confident people you see out there, your Elon Musk, whoever. I think everyone has that inner voice that's always talking to them. So I think it's, it's two things. It's number one, realizing that the fact that everyone has this voice means that maybe that voice isn't true, right? Maybe there is something there that you're not seeing about yourself that is actually that confident person who can do things. And then the second thing is take action. So the world has um, what they call an action bias, and that means maybe you have horrible ideas, maybe you have good ideas, maybe you have average ideas. Um, but if those ideas stay on your head, they're never going to do anything, right? So you need to take action. So whenever you have these self-doubts about, oh, I can't do this, or I'm not that person or whatever, just take action because the world only sees action. It doesn't see what's going on inside your head. So if you ever having these, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that, just go for it, man. Just go for it. Thank you, I really appreciate you doing this for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching, thank you for watching, like, 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 comment, 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 and subscribe to our 